Matthew chapter five. While we're turning there, I was thinking about our missionary family that was with us this past week and uh, the video that they showed on Sunday morning. If you got a chance to see that, it was very moving. And I, I think the, the most gripping part of that uh, video is when uh, Mrs. Me was texting with uh, this Muslim lady and uh, she was having a, a crisis of faith, I think is what she called it. And uh, she said, well, you need to get your Bible and then we're going to try to get some answers. And the response back was, I don't have a Bible. And I was thinking this morning, you know, there would be no point in us having this men's study if we didn't have the Bible. You know, they're, they're, we're just going to share opinions and ideas about things and we're not going to make a lot of progress. So I'm thankful that we're different and we're coming from different backgrounds and different personalities, but we can all unite around the absolute truth of the word of God and we can be helped as men and we can grow today in the Lord. I want to deal with a topic that is very important for us as men and um, the Lord just put this on my heart. Like I said, weeks and weeks ago, I prepared this. So I just refreshed a little bit this morning on it. Um, but God gave me this thought. Uh, this is from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. Uh, his mm -hmm. disciples have, have come to him, and uh, he is teaching them. Of course, it starts with the Beatitudes at the beginning. There's some uh, teachings on uh, being the light of the world and things about salt and light. Uh, he gives then uh, some instructions about different things. Um, he's kind of bouncing from one thing to the next, but some teachings on temptation, which we're going to look at, divorce, oaths, forgiveness, and even loving your enemies, all here in uh, chapter 5. I want us to hone in on verse 27 to 29. 27 to 29. Uh, so let me get three guys to volunteer to read those verses. We're all going to look back uh, at verse 28 just a second, but um, John, if you would read the first one, uh, 27, Brian, 28, and then somebody else, 29, and get another reader, Harry. Okay, so let's go in that order. John, Brian, Harry, let's all follow along. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her have committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Okay, thank you. Let's all take a look there at verse 28. And uh, look again, I'll read a second time. It says, but mm -hmm. I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So I want to bring a lesson on uh, adultery of the heart. And just uh, by way of opening, let me say that what was a the problem then is still a problem now, if not a bigger problem now than it was even in the times of Jesus. Uh, these statistics are from a book called See No Evil and uh, might be worth the read. Another book I'm going to reference is uh, this book, Randy Alcorn's book, The Purity Principle. This one's a little bit uh, smaller. It's, it's not as new as this other book. But these statistics, I mean, you don't have to hear these to know this is an issue. Um, but I, I think it reminds us of how big of an issue this is. Uh, so here's some startling stats. First exposure to pornography among men is 11 years old on average. 57% of teens search out pornography at least monthly. 51% of male students and 32% of female students first viewed pornography before their teenage years. It's hard to get your mind around all of these numbers, but 71% uh, of teenagers hide online behavior from their parents. 68% of divorce cases involve one party meeting a new lover over the internet. 56% of divorce cases involve one party having an obsessive interest in pornographic websites. One in five youth pastors and one in seven senior pastors use pornography on a regular basis and are currently struggling. 
53% of senior pastors and youth pastors say they've struggled with pornography in the past. 64% of Christian men and 15% of Christian women say they watch pornography at least once a month. You know, and there's so many more statistics and they aren't very uplifting, but there's there's enough for us to realize this is a major, major problem uh, that needs to be addressed. And there's no shortage of resources, books and, and uh, you know, podcasts and blogs that might help us with that. But I just want to remind all of us that the greatest resource when it comes to personal purity is the word of God. And it doesn't get any better than the words of Jesus himself, who was tempted in all points like as we are. So he faced every imaginable temptation that we could think of, yet the Bible says without sin. So he's speaking from a, a place of understanding. He know he made us as men. He knows what stimulates us and drives us as men. And so he is able to speak very clearly in just three verses, you know, the volumes of books written about this issue. And I would caution you, some books might help and some might hinder. Uh, you don't have to know everything about evil to know that it's evil. So be careful of that. I try to be careful of that. Uh, but Jesus covers the topic. He discusses the issue and then he gives us a very clear solution. Some people are good at revealing the problem, but they have no solution. Jesus gives a solution to uh, this issue uh, that's a major problem, not just in the world, but in our churches. And we're going to be faced with this either in our personal lives or we're going to meet somebody that's having a major struggle, and we need to know how to biblically help this person. So we, we come to uh, a topic that is very fitting for a men's study. So I want to look at this. We're going to answer some questions uh, together, discussion questions, just two questions. The second question will have three uh, points that I'll give you on that one. But the first question, just the definition. What is adultery of the heart? So look at the verse again. Let me back up to verse 27 first. You've heard that it was said by them of old time. So when he says them of old time, who is he referencing here? The old timers. Who are the old timers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Moses and Israel. And we're talking about the law and the prophets, right? And by the way, there's a lot of wisdom you can glean from the old timers. There's nothing wrong with being an old timer. There's nothing wrong with being a little bit old fashioned in our approach and our thinking. Not everything new is untrue, but a lot of what is new is untrue. And so it's good to understand the teachings of the old times. And I want to remind you that Jesus didn't come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill the law. He didn't come to lower the standard. He came to raise the standard. And there's this thinking, and it's it's not a right thinking today, that we're New Testament Christians, so we're under grace, and we can kind of do whatever we want to do, and Jesus will forgive us, and we'll be fine. That is not biblical teaching. That is not the idea of New Testament Christianity. Yes, we are under grace. Praise God. We're not under the law. But the grace of God leads us to salvation. But the grace of God, according to Titus, also teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. So the grace of God teaches us to not live an unbridled, lustful life, but to live a disciplined, godly life. So this idea of radical grace, I mean, Paul addressed that in his writings in Romans you know, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What was the answer? Anybody? God forbid, God forbid you know, we're, we're not to abuse the grace of God. It's not a license for us to sin. So Jesus was not, he was not minimizing what the old timer said and what the law said when he says, thou shalt not commit adultery. He's going to raise the standard. So we're to live above the law, not below the law. Verse 28 but I say unto you, so here's what they said. This was the, I believe, the seventh uh, commandment that was given uh, when it says we're not to commit adultery. He says in verse 28, but I send you that whosoever. So this is a general principle, a general truth that applies to every person. Whosoever looketh on a woman 
And notice those words, looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So he's speaking of what we would call adultery of the heart. While we're considering a biblical definition for this uh, term, adultery of the heart, let me, um, let me read uh, something from Barnes's commentary. I'll read a couple of things here. So it's a little bit, this one's a little bit longer, but I think it helps us understand the uh, scribes and Pharisees, they were very scrupulous, um, very mindful of the law, but their interpretation wasn't always accurate, the way they would interpret and, and then uh, apply. Uh, Barnes says this, our Savior in these verses explains that the seventh commandment, uh, it is, he explains the seventh commandment. It is probable that the Pharisees had explained this commandment as with the sixth, as extending only to the external act, and that they regarded evil thoughts and a wanton imagination as of little consequence or as not forbidden by the law. Our Savior assures them that the commandment did not regard the external act merely, but the secrets of the heart and even the movements of the eye. He declares that they who indulge a wanton desire, that they who look on a woman to increase their lust, have already, in the sight of God, violated the commandment and committed adultery in the heart. Such was the guilt of David, whose deep and awful crime fully shows the danger of indulging in evil desires and the rovings of a wanton eye. So, what would be a simple definition of this looking on a woman's lust? What is what is the uh, what's the definition of adultery of the heart? How can, how could we explain this or define this? Anybody I have a definition, but let me give you a chance here. All right, here's what I had. Okay, and it's all else. It's a little bit of a tongue twister. All right, uh, a lingering look. So when he says look it on. All right, this is this is more than just looking. There's there's a second look. The second look is the sinful look. It's a lingering look. It's the idea of gazing on or staring at, turning the eyes toward, giving the mind and the thought uh, process as well. So it's a lingering look that leads to a lingering look that leads to a lustful longing. Sorry, it's a lot of L's, but it just kind of fit. Lingering look that leads to a lustful longing. So the first look isn't isn't sin. Okay, we live in a wicked world. We know that. And uh, sometimes you, you wish that you could just live in a box or in a room and never come out because it's inevitable. You're going to see something you don't want to see. It's going to happen. But we have to learn to look away, not look on, not gaze at but to look away quickly and, and, and ask God to take those seed thoughts out of our mind. So that's what the, the adultery of the heart, it's lingering look that's going to lead to the, the lustful longing in our heart. Uh, that's what was forbidden by Christ. That's the coveting. That's the desiring. Um, let me read another statement here from Matthew Poole in his commentary. He says, the scope of our Savior in these verses is the very same as in the verses immediately preceding. He's correcting the interpretation which the Pharisees had put upon the divine law to show that he, instead of coming to destroy the law, came to fulfill it uh, as other ways. So by giving a more strict and true interpretation of it, whereas they interpreted it only as to overt acts which disturb human society and break civil order. He is showing that it reaches to the inward thoughts and the unlawful desires of the heart and any other means that have a tendency to such prohibited acts. I remember when I was in Christian high school, we had a health teacher and he only taught one year. And I, I understand why um, some of his teaching philosophy about certain things was was not accurate. Um, wasn't biblical, but I remember him teaching some things about sex ed, and he was trying to do it from a Christian perspective. 
But he basically told us, and I think this is what got back to the administration, that it's okay to look as long as you don't touch. And he didn't elaborate a lot, but you know, as I'm hearing as a young man, I'm thinking that's not right thinking because if you look long enough, you will want to and will eventually touch. I mean, think of the example of Aiken. He was, uh, you know, he was in a place where he knew God's command, and yet he said, "I saw, I coveted, then I took." That is always the progression of sin. If you focus on something long enough, then you're going to want it and you're going to eventually take it. That's the progression. So that's why Jesus is saying you're focused on the act. I'm focused on the heart. I'm focused on the eyes. If you can guard what you focus on, then you can control your mind. You control your actions. Uh, So he's raising the standard here. I'm thankful for my dad and his um, faithfulness to God and, and his standards of purity, uh, protecting himself, protecting our uh, our family. I remember my dad, so I played at uh, public school, high school on the basketball team. And, uh, you know, it was good for me. I was always out at halftime. We were in the locker room. And even at that point, the halftime show is not something that Christians should watch uh, with our cheerleaders. And so my dad would always go out for a snack. You know, it was like, yeah, I'm going out to get a snack. I don't know if you ever got a snack, but he would excuse himself because he didn't want to be in a place where he would see something. And, you know, I appreciate that example. We were just at a basketball game, uh, the Mars basketball game on Tuesday, and we did the same thing. It was like, yeah, we're going out to get a snack, you know, because I don't want to be in a position where I'm going to see something that could lead to what Jesus is warning up here in this passage. So we have to be proactive and recognize what we focus on will impact our minds and ultimately what we do. Uh, Here's a couple of verses I want to point out before we move into the more practical side of this. Let's go back to the book of Job and let's go to Job 31.1. Job 31.1. We understand from chapter one that Job was a just man, perfect uh, in his ways, not perfect as in sinless, but he was sinning less and less. He was a man of integrity and honesty and purity. He eschewed evil. Uh, he didn't he didn't uh, mess around with evil. In 31:1, he says this, "I made a covenant with mine eyes." Why then should I think upon a maid? So he's saying, I made a covenant with my eyes that I would not set anything wicked. David talked about that, not setting anything wicked before his eyes. So he made a covenant. I'm not going to look because if I look at that, then I'm going to start to think about that. And if I think about it long enough, then I'm going to do it. So he made a covenant and all of us ought to make a covenant. Uh, There's a, a resource, a Christian resource out there. Uh, It's called Covenant Eyes. I think it goes back to this verse. And if you're having trouble with Internet um, issues on your phone or computer, it might be well worth the investment to get Covenant Eyes on there to provide accountability and protection for you because uh, it's just so available today. Uh, But he talks about the, the eyes. Go back to 2415, Job 2415. interesting statement here he says the eye also of the adulterer waited for the twilight saying no eye shall see me and distinguish or this and he disguised his face so it's the eye of the adulterer he doesn't talk about the hand uh, he doesn't talk about other things he just says it's the eye it always starts with the eye and uh, he understood what jesus is preaching here in the sermon on the mount and we need to understand that as well that men are visually stimulated so uh, we have to be so careful. We need to encourage our wives to be careful and have an understanding of this as well, that no Christian wife should be seeking uh, the eye of anyone but her husband. And that's that's very important. It kind of goes both ways. Men have to guard their eyes. Women have to guard what they wear or don't wear. Uh, we live in a culture that's undressing in public and not feeling any shame about that. It's a ma- major issue. So uh, we have to understand where it begins uh, the seeds of adultery begin with the eye and the heart so that's 
a definition, maybe not the only definition, but the lingering look that leads to those lustful longings. By the way, um, from the book of James, lust is not sin. Uh, lust is a desire. It can be a good desire or an evil desire. Lust is what leads to sin. Uh, temptation and lust together will lead to sin. But but having a desire uh, doesn't necessarily mean that that's sin. Uh, there's a desire within marriage God gives to us, and that's that's where it should be. But when it's outside of marriage is when uh, that becomes an evil desire. So that's the definition. Now, let's move into the practical side. We understand this is a problem. We don't have to look at much of the statistics to understand this is an issue in our world, in our culture, in our churches, and maybe even in our own lives. This is this is every man's battle. This is not a this is not a battle that we're going to win until ultimately we're with Christ. It's a battle we're engaged in. It's not something we win and it's done and now I've been delivered from lust and evil desires. This is an ongoing thing that we must face uh, as long as we're in this flesh. So uh, we understand the, the situation. We understand the danger. Uh, we understand what Jesus is saying. But how then do we get victory over this? Christian had shared uh, a podcast with me, and it, was, it wasn't just about this issue. It was about self-discipline in general. And it covered some of these things, too. But uh, the host of the podcast was sharing some personal experiences. He had a young man came to him, so I'm struggling with pornography. And the host said, well, you know, what's your plan to get victory? And he said, you know, I don't really have a plan. He said, I'm just going to try to focus more on the grace of Jesus, the forgiveness of Jesus. No matter what I do, I know he'll forgive me. And this man gently rebuked him because he said, that is not the teaching of the New Testament, that Christ has called us to purity. And it is very difficult, but it is not impossible. So what Jesus is saying, this is going to be hard, but this is not impossible. And he gives us a plan. And I love how, how simple this is in verse 29. You don't have to read volumes of books. And though there are helpful resources out there, Jesus in one verse tells us, guys, here's how you can have victory over these, these sexual sins. OK, here it is. Verse 29. He says, and if thy right eye offend thee. Pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Okay, help me a little bit. I'm going to give you three thoughts here, but uh, what is the remedy or solution so that we might avoid the adultery of the heart? <laughs> Yeah, Keep lying. Hey, that that would solve a lot of issues, right? Uh, the Pharisees had uh, different ideas about this, and there was a group called the Bleeding Pharisees. I've mentioned them before, and they were they were bloodied because they would always walk around blindfolded because they didn't want to see something that might cause them to sin. I don't know that we need to go to that measure, but sometimes you almost think about it, you know. Um, but yeah, there's be, be blind to, to certain uh, things. Anybody else, Andrew? I mean, one, I'm sure this is very, I think that is very good. And I do think, I mean, I look at this passage a lot of times. I think there's probably, it's sad, there's probably going to be people in hell who are going to say, I wish I did cut my own. Um, but the other practical point here would be if you can't, instead of casting your eye out, casting that thing, goes back up in the plan, yeah. casting that thing out. For, you know, I have cut the nuts. Yeah. I think it's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. My wife has access to my yeah. phone, yeah. and I want my son to have access or to have covenant eyes too. And you know, we'll have accountability. But I took that thing, whatever it was, and I cast it out. Yeah. I, I don't have access to it. Yeah. And I think for me, reading that passage, that's what it is. I'm not going to cast my eye out at this point, right? Yeah. I'm not casting <laughs> anything that could be a possibility. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me read just a statement on that. Um, I can find it here. Yeah, my. Uh... Oh, here it is. Um, no, it doesn't. Anyways, it wasn't meant to read it. But I think the the idea Andrew's saying is we're not we're not talking about a literal uh, plucking your eye out. You know that I mean, 
if I guess if that's needed, but I don't think that's the idea of what Jesus is saying here. But he's saying, first off, let me go back to the, the uh, letter A. We are required, if we're going to avoid this sin, we're required to identify what I would call trigger points. So you've got you to understand, okay, what is causing the offense? The, the word offend there, the Greek is scandalizo. We get our English word scandal, uh, scandalous from it. So it's to entrap, to trip up, to stumble, to cause to sin. So we have to, have to identify what are the areas in my life that are causing me to have thoughts or maybe leading me into a place of temptation. Identify those. So it's going to be different for... Uh, different ones based on your schedule and where you work and where you shop and your family dynamic. I mean, all those things are going to be different, but you have to identify in your life, what are the trigger points? And the, the right eye was the readier and dear of the two. Uh, but this man here says, it's, it's my right eye that's causing me to stumble. I heard about a missionary or maybe it was just an evangelist, but when they would travel, they were in hotels a lot and they were by themselves and they recognized that the TV was a stumbling block, that there wasn't accountability and, you know, you're going from one channel to the next and there would just be that temptation. And so they reached a point, they said, you know what, if I'm going to watch TV, it's only going to be in the lobby that I'm going to, I'm not even going to turn the TV on. And they made that covenant with their eyes to reduce that amount of temptation and identifying those trigger points is very important. I heard a message on King David, and of course, you know, we've already mentioned him. This was an issue that it, adultery of the heart became actual adultery and led to other sins. But the message, one of the points was we have to guard our vantage points. So from his elevated position in uh, David's castle, he could see things that other people could not see. And he did not guard those vantage points. And that's what led to uh, the adultery in his life. So we have to identify trigger points. Um, I guess I'll, I'll move to this illustration from this book. And I've read this before, so forgive me, but I think it, it helps. It's called Wise Strategies, Chapter 6 of the Security Principle. Randy Alcorn says, imagine someone whose weakness is eating donuts. Do you remember this one, anybody, the donut example? All right, I, I like donuts, and I have to too, so I can identify. His doctor says no more donuts. He vows to God, no more donuts. He promises his family, no more donuts. He calls the church and gets on the prayer chain. He even goes to a donut deliverance ministry to have the demon of donut desire cast out of him. <laughs> He has a lot of these. Here's a guy who means business, right? But then what does he do? Well, he's like a lot of us. He goes right on reading about donuts, listening to donut music, watching television programs about making donuts. He spends his time with other donut lovers talking about donuts. He jokes about donuts at the office where he often glances at the donut calendars on the wall. He looks through the newspaper for donut coupons and subscribes to Donut Desires with its gloss color photos. It's not long before he's driving a long way to work that just happens to go by a donut shop. He rolls down the window and he inhales. Pretty soon he's buying the morning paper from the rack right outside the donut <laughs> shop. He, this guy has quite the imagination, doesn't he? <laughs> he's lingering just long enough to check out donuts through the window then he remembers he has to make a phone call and, hey, what do you know? The donut shop has a paid phone. <clears throat> Since he's there anyway, why not have a cup of coffee? Now, remember, this man has no intention of breaking his vow and eating donuts, but the totally predictable and inevitable result is what? That he will give in and eat donuts. And can't we hear his sad lament? What went wrong? I prayed. I asked others to pray. I asked God for deliverance. Why try? I give up. You do your best and look what happens. The problem here with this man is he has either not identified or not got serious about the situation. I was uh, listening to a sermon the other day, and the pastor said something similar about donuts. He said there was a guy that was uh, praying, God, if, if you 
if you uh, you know don't want me to eat donuts, then don't make a spot available at the donut shop. And he said to his pastor, said, you know, I drove around eight times and eventually there was a spot open. So I thought it must have been God. So anyways, trigger points. You've got to know you and, and know what triggers those things in your life and what's going to cause you to stumble. Now, the second thought here I want to give you is along the same lines, we have to become radical in our approach, radical in our approach. Uh, my parents, my dad grew up in a Methodist church and my mom grew up in a Baptist church and they got married and they uh, were trying to figure out where they wanted to become members and God led them to an independent Baptist church. And I grew up at the Mansfield Baptist Temple. And I remember my parents talking about the time that they gave up mixed swimming. And, you know, that's not something we always talk about. But again, it goes back to my dad saying, OK, I don't want to be in a place where I'm tempted to fall as a Christian man. And we kind of stood out as kids when we couldn't go and hang out and go to the pool parties. But my dad realized that if I put my boys in a place where they're seeing things, it's going to lead to temptation and sin. I can't do that. And so I appreciate, you know, again, his stand of that was pretty radical in those days to do what my dad did. And not everybody understood, but he was willing to take an approach of if this is an offense, like Andrew said, there, there's no price that's too expensive to pay for personal purity. And sometimes it involves getting very radical. Maybe it's removing some apps or it's changing, you know, we go through the mall and my wife and my daughter, I mean, they love the mall and we kind of tolerate the mall, you know, as men, <laughs> we try to find the Lego shop or sport, you know, something, <laughs> you know, but we've learned and now we don't even say anything about it. We've learned, okay, we're going on this side, you know, because this store is here. Or we're going upstairs and then we're coming down because this store is here and we don't need that temptation. So we just got now we just know everybody knows like this. We just we go a certain path because certain stores are here and we just learned that because we don't want to put ourselves in a place of temptation. So it's it's getting radical is what Jesus is saying uh, and plucking out the eye. How could that be profitable to pluck out the eye? Well, leads me to point three. We have to focus on the big picture. Focus on the big picture. He says, cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. I was looking at the word hell there, Gehenna. Uh, there was a literal valley in Jerusalem, the valley of Gehenna. There was a place of filth is where the dead animals of the city were cast out and burned. Um, the dung of the city was cast there. And it was a symbol of destruction and damage. So is this talking about literally going to hell? You know, if you commit adultery, does that mean you're going to go to hell? I don't believe that's true. Uh, you can find forgiveness. You're going to deal with a lot of consequences from that. But you can find forgiveness. And there, you know, look at David. I mean, he committed adultery and he was forgiven. And, and there, there are many other examples of that. But what is this talking about with hell? Maybe the application is that the destruction and damage that adultery brings is similar to this valley of Gehenna. It was a repulsive place. The smells, uh, everything, the sights, uh, the most unpleasant place you can imagine. That was this valley. And that the devil doesn't show you that when he's he's putting these thoughts or images in your mind. He doesn't show you the big picture. He wants you to focus on the immediate. He wants you to look at the prize and not the price. And Jesus is saying, if you're going to get victory, you have to identify trigger points, get radical in your approach and look at the big picture. Do you want to spend your life living in that valley uh, that place of destruction and misery because of decisions you made. The honest truth is any of us in this room could make decisions today that would impact us the rest of our lives. So we have to 
look at that big picture. And mature people are willing to let go of some things, even things that maybe they enjoy. They're willing to let go of that because they see the bigger picture of what this impact might have. Uh, last thing I want to read here, going back to this book. Uh, this is in uh, the last chapter, chapter 10. Confession, accountability, and counting the cost. So counting the cost, he says that uh, he had developed a list of consequences that would result from immorality. And he said periodically he would read his list until he memorized it, and it would cut like a knife through the fogs of rationalization. He said it filled him with a healthy fear. So the list is, what would my adultery do? Here's the list. One, drag in the mud the reputation of my Lord. Number two, make me have to look in the face, in his face one day and tell him why I did it. Next, cause untold hurt to Nancy, my loyal wife and best friend. Forfeit Nancy's respect and trust. Permanently injure my credibility with my beloved daughters, Karina and Angie. Bring great shame to my family. Inflict hurt on my church and friends, especially those I've led to Christ and disciple. Bring irretrievable loss of years of witnessing to relatives and friends. Bring pleasure to Satan, God's enemy. Possibly give me a sexually transmitted disease posing a risk to Nancy. Lose my self-respect, discredit my name, and invoke lifelong embarrassment upon myself. And the list could go on and on, but that's a person that is focusing on the big picture. And I think that is a wise thing for all of us to do if we're going to avoid this specific sin. I know this is kind of a heavy topic, but I think it's something we have to come back to often as men. And it helps us if we're in this together, we're fighting the same fight. And you might need an accountability partner. Uh, I remember having a conversation with a pastor. He and I had just found out about another pastor that had fallen into sin. And he said to me, he said, Nathan, the only solution to this increasing epidemic of immorality is increased accountability. We have to increase accountability. And as Andrew mentioned, you know, that starts with, if you're married, the accountability of your wife. Uh, my wife checked, she can get into all my inboxes. She reads all my texts. Um, you know, I don't, I don't hide anything from her. She can, whatever she wants to look at, she can look at it. I don't clear my history. I can't clear my history. You know, there's a lot of safeguards because I don't, I don't want that possibility, that temptation. So a wise person increases accountability. We all need that. And I want to encourage you, if you're struggling with this, um, seek out help. Admit your needs. Uh, get into God's word with somebody else. Just be open and honest. That's where, where it starts. And I think that uh, God will he'll allow us to see victory in these areas. Pastor, can I share your mm -hmm. testimony? Absolutely. Yeah. I was single until I was 44 years old. And as you can imagine, as a red-blooded American man, mm -hmm. I struggled with the same things that everyone does. And uh, I tried all of the, you know, the, the discipline, the self-discipline, the self-flagellation, the accountability, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, it's it, it goes so far. But what I learned, I, I see here in this passage, it's such a good passage, you know, in verses, verse 28, Jesus is talking about the, the looking at a woman to lust after her. But he says earlier in verse eight, blessed are the pure in heart, mm -hmm. for they shall yep. see God. And I think yep. what I learned is that I was not valuing the satisfaction in God and Christ highly enough. Um, book of first John, John says um, everyone who has that hope, that hope of seeing Christ mm -hmm. purifies himself as he is pure. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's that was what became the solution. I'm not saying that I, that I, I stand here, this mm -hmm. pure as the driven snow, yeah. strong as an oak man yeah. of God that never has a wayward thought. But the solution is uh, I found a, a there's a quote from a pastor named John Piper. He says, 
a passion for God's infinite value will sever the root of all Judas joys. Mm -hmm. And so what I began to do as a single man with no one in my home to keep me accountable, part of my faith journey was desperately running to the scriptures every morning to find my joy in Christ so that for the rest of the day, my satisfaction would be there. Amen. And all those other temptations just began to just began to fade and pale in comparison because I knew that it would not ever, even if I could have whatever I wanted in that sinful direction, it would not come close yeah. to the satisfaction I had in Christ. Oh, yeah. And to add to that, it's unrealistic <laughs> to think that your spouse can fulfill every desire you have. God did not design marriage to be that. We complete each other and we help each other. But your spouse is never to take the place of God. Mm -hmm. And Jeff is married now. Praise God for that. It's yeah. wonderful. But Wendy is not to replace God in his life. If our spouse replaces God, that's an issue. Our spouse is now our idol. They become our God. So that's those expectations must be lowered. And but that well said. I, and I love the tie-in with the with the earlier thought about pure in heart. That's the opposite of the polluted in heart is the pure in heart. Um, that's that's great. Somebody else want to add to that? We got a few few minutes here, Christian. Yeah, kind of going off with you know, what was said and everything. I mean, like I look at verse twenty-eight. You know, to look upon a woman to lust after her, and I think that's going to ultimately come back to well, what's what's your desire? Mm -hmm. You know, um, obviously this would be intentional. Uh, you know, two lusties, you know, he or she's longing after that person. You know, so they're trying to fill a void. Uh, you know, something that they don't have or they're, you know, or that they're not keeping on um, after, um, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it kind of reminds me of Paul, different situation. I mean, he's going through persecution and uh, suffering. It's not necessarily, you know, lusting or, or, you know, or anything else like that, but to, you know, but his ultimate goal was to have that joy, but it was a continuous joy, you know, I mean, it wasn't at the end, I'm going to get joy at the end, but I'm going to maintain and sustain this joy, even, you know, for example, as, as I'm going through persecution, so I think we can have the right desire and get that joy, you know, you know from God, and then maintain that, sustain it, and yeah. then our eyes, you know, hopefully we're going to be looking away. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Christian. Anybody else have a comment on that? Thank you. Uh, first, thank you very much. This needs to be talked about. I mean, just talk about a lot of the statistics themselves, and it's easy to shy away. I, I've spoken on it before, and it's like before God was probably like, you sure you want me to go there? It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want you to go there. Everyone, you know, we need it. Yeah. Uh, but um, I want to just take what you said, and I agree with all of it, and maybe just add a little bit of extra application. You mentioned how you look at something, think about it, and you do it. It's very true. But it's very possible to look at something, want something, and never actually do it. It's still just as wrong. Mm -hmm. and adultery mm -hmm. of the heart without physical adultery yep. is still just as wrong and if nobody ever knows about it but you and God yep. there are consequences and it affects yep. your relationship with God and it affects your relationship with your wife even if she doesn't even know mm -hmm. she'll know something's different mm -hmm. and uh, so it's just you know Jesus says you look at a little less like you commit adultery in your heart that's all you ever did no physical you are still yep. wrong yep. And, it, and I just I love that point Jeff that you made satisfaction in Christ mm -hmm. it is so true Nothing compares yep. to that sense. Yep. Amen. Yep. So Amen. just basically chime in. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Anybody else? Give you a moment and we're going to pray. Just yes. um, years ago, I read a book and I can't remember the author, but it was called Every Man's Battle. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it was about dealing with pornography and those kinds of things. And one of the solutions that it was putting forth is when you're out in public and you see something that could be temptation, mm -hmm. it used the term bounce. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You look away. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah. then it's not going to be a, a lingering yes. look. Yes. And um, right. right. You know, I don't know if that's a total solution, but it's uh, yeah. it's a first step, I think. Yes. Yeah. And training yourself, you know, it's muscle memory. You're training your eyes to look away instead of looking toward. And I think the more you do that, the more that your eyes will will turn away. Yeah, that's a, that's a good thought. Yeah. Before I was married, my best friend had been married for a long time and he he was always beating the drum and, and whenever he knew I was getting married, he, he was trying to 
prepare me and coach me. He says, what he tries to do all day long, I, I starve my eyes from my life. Mm -hmm. So when I get home, she's yeah. just like a breath of fresh air. Yeah. yeah. Yep. That's good. Yeah. Those are all helpful terms. Um, I, I wanted to make a comment. Oh, it's your fun. Yep. It's amazing how the devil uh, looks for an opportunity. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be this hard course for an other people. Yeah. So I spent a lot of time on my bike. That's mm -hmm. what I do for cardio. And either because I'm lazy or I don't have enough time, I spent a lot of it on rollers, which is in my basement looking at the wall. Yeah. And yeah. To avoid the boredom, um, I have Netflix. Mm -hmm. Right. So I watch a lot of Netflix because I hate it already. <laughs> 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 and, you know, it's amazing how many movies I watch the amount of time on my bicycle and not watch it anymore. You know that? Yeah. You know, crazy yeah. movies are right. But it's almost <laughs> it's hard to find yeah. it's impossible. Yep. anything. I know. You know? I know. And, yep. and you know, it's amazing the devil knows my situation. Yeah. yeah. Yep. We all hate cardio. <laughs> <laughs> so it is yeah. it's very subtle. Yes, it's very it, it is. It is. It's everywhere. Yep. Yep. And that's an example of you knowing your situation and your battle. It's the same battle, but it's okay. it's specific to your schedule. And so you have to, how can I protect myself in, in my schedule? What can God, and, and there's always a solution. There's something that God will show us to help us with that. Okay, Larry, and then we'll pray. You know, I worked in my safety for 40 and a half years, and these guys would leave their wives or cheat on their wives and all that. I've never seen a, a woman that has compared to my wife mm -hmm. as that I want to be with or any of that, you know. It yeah. just, uh, yeah. and when I'm away from my wife, I can't wait to get home. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know, I know. that. Uh, but uh, I was dealing her yesterday. I had made fish for supper, and I said, you know, you rate just a little bit above a fish. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just don't understand, yeah. man. Yeah. Uh, I, I really don't. I, a lot of them have good good wives. And uh, I worked with a lady younger than me, right beside of me for probably 20 years, and ain't no way I've seen anything mm -hmm. that... Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just don't understand men. Yeah. And I get women are the same way, too, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, we're wretched. That's what yeah. we need to know, all of us. Because I've been core. around my wife since first and third grade, so mm -hmm. she's the only woman I know and right. the only one I ever want. Yeah. Amen. Well, with that, let's pray. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, thank you for these men and, and the maturity that we can look at a topic like this and discuss it openly and even be transparent about our own struggles that we would have and face. Lord, we we know that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And so, uh, Lord, we know that all of us are susceptible to this. We can make decisions and in a moment, Lord, that we would regret a lifetime. So we pray for your help. We know that temperance is fruit of the spirit, Lord. We cannot overcome our flesh on our own. It's too strong. So we need your help by the spirit. And Lord, we pray that we would find our joy and satisfaction in you. Uh, Lord, we know that you would give us the uh, desires of our heart and satisfy us with your presence and your goodness. Lord, I pray that we would uh, be protected and vigilant, guarded. Uh, Lord, help us to uh, evaluate not only our decisions, but how they impact our families, others. Lord, I pray that you would help us to follow the teachings of Jesus on this. And thank you, God, for the input today. And thank you for the truth and help us to go forth and be pure and thank you, Lord, for the blessings today of meeting together as men. Give us a good weekend, and Lord, uh, just help us as we prepare for your house tomorrow. In Jesus' name, amen.
but thank you guys for coming. I think you've got to watch music, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. They, they've got one real negative, who's not going.